I, as I delved into the commentaries on one particular policy related to different types of women, which are divided into what we call Sharifa and Diniya, which is, we can translate respectively as the noble and the ignoble woman, that under the category of the ignoble woman was, I found scholars saying that it was black woman. And naturally, um, um, I was troubled by it because it seemed to promote uh, a different type of policy uh, which actually left black women vulnerable to the exploits of certain men uh, because fundamentally what the idea was that since this black woman, among certain other types of women as well, that they were deemed to be undesirables, that they were considered to be fit for marriage to any man. And for this reason, they can choose whoever they wanted to to be their guardians in order to marry them off, you know, even in the presence of a, a relative, you know, guardian. So if a father objects, but then an individual who's not a father decides, well, forget about your father, I'll be your, your guardian. Uh, and if the marriage occurs, then these scholars were validating that particular policy uh, in the school. Could they say, well, this is a woman, she's not desirable to begin with, so she's kuf, she's uh, compatible with any particular woman. I mean, any particular man, of course, I'm sorry. You know, she's she compatible with any particular man. So, uh, so, so naturally troubled because of the associations between blackness and the world from which we all come, or the idea uh, when you should see black and you automatically uh, you, you react based upon your own perceptions of what that means. Um, I wanted to try to understand like, why Muslim scholars might actually consider such a policy to be um, uh, fair, right? to be a fair policy. So as I delved deeper into the issue, uh, it led me to the study of race in general, right? and race constructs, uh, and how ideas about race have uh, evolved throughout history. Uh, and ultimately, what I did find was that uh, in spite of the fact that uh, race differs, even still today in many parts of the world, and people's perceptions and conceptions of race differ in different parts of the world, that uh, I, I saw something that looked like a, a transhistorical and perennial disdain for black skin and darker since skin uh, throughout uh, human history. Uh, now, it's not always the African that this is directed at, but it turns out that, and, and, and uh, at least in a very, a very ancient tradition, that certain, a certain group of blacks were viewed as being uh, the prototypical savage, I guess you would say. Right? And, um, and I, 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 I felt, and felt that I, would, I had discovered uh, a link or the, the actual location of that particular group of people in East Africa, which in Arabic referred to as the Zanj. Uh, um, so one particular book of history uh, an Arab history book uh, which described the Zanj, and, and, and well, actually, multiple. Ms. Udi uh, mentions it as well. Uh, um, the, the Zanj people, and even Ibn Khaldun makes, uh, and alludes to them and calls a group, group of people the Limnan people. Uh, and uh, these are people who are described as being uh, completely naked, they were cannibals. Uh, they were war or bellicose people that they love warfare as well, you know, so they're constantly uh, antagonistic uh, and in a sense in a sense sort of like appear to be people operating on some of like the reptilian brain type of uh, that level you know? uh, In spite of and in spite of their uh, Sort of bellicose nature that often they would lose wars too and then would make slaves of others as well so so fundamentally what it had awakened within me uh, was the real realization that from, from most of our history, even in the continent of Africa, um, 
Africans themselves didn't see themselves as a as a homogenous race, right? And, and so, and, and, the, and other people didn't see themselves as a homogenous race. And uh, so, which led me to, again, after a lot of research, to conclude that most of the time, if not all of the times, that you find references to, uh, or negative references to blacks in the Hadith literature, uh, and in um, even certain writings from other religious traditions, that they are not talking about all people that we ourselves would consider to be black people. They were talking about a particular type of black person. And so, and I just believe that the original connotation of the term, term Negro, even in the English language, was a very negative connotation. Or as one scholar put it, the only difference between uh, a nigger and a Negro was that the former uh, was a slave and the latter was free, right? But both deemed to be um, uh, uh, a derogatory term referred to people. Now, of course, we know our history and over time, the blacks in America, they embraced uh, this term and they see it and trans well, they transformed it into a different type of um, word or positive, a positive word and identified with it. Because you know, there's a time you can call a person a Negro, but you can call them black. Right? People get upset, you call them black. Well, I'm not black, you know, but I'm a Negro. But Negro means black. But it was embraced by many of our our predecessors in our particular context. All right, so, um, so I mean, so a fundamental, I think a, a fundamental issue, which is important to, to highlight, uh, then when we read such materials, such words, is that, that, that black meant something specifically, or something specific. Uh, it went, it, it didn't mean what it means for us today. Um, I want to I want to open up the book, but before opening up the book to read some of this this information, um, I did want to also introduce the book by speaking about the story. Uh, and we know that the uh, one of the most famous, or perhaps the most famous, black person in Islamic history is Bilal Ibn Rabah. May Allah be pleased with him. And um, during the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet وسلم, after um, subduing a um, small sort of resistance that was there and then um, smashing the ayahs of the Kaaba, he had Bilal climb the Kaaba to announce to the people to gather so that they could hear the Prophet's speech. As Bilal ibn Rabah is climbing the Kaaba, Three of the individuals who had just surrendered and accepted Islam on that day, they are among the chieftains of Mecca. They were watching this. They're observing Bilal climb of the Kaaba. It's a story I don't think we generally hear much about, but it's in the books, in the books of Tafsir. It's, it's there. So Bilal is climbing. One of them says, I'm glad my father is dead. And he, 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 was, he didn't live long enough to see this. Um, a second person says, uh, um, you know, if God wants some good or wants to change this, then he will, he'll, he'll do so. All right. And then the third person is reported to have said something along the lines of, did Muhammad not have anyone other than this black crow to call the summons? Now, word got back to the Prophet, and he gave a speech. Um, and part of that speech is the following, uh, it's recorded, so, oh, ye men, O oh people, Allah has rid you of the, of the vainglory of the pre Islamic period and your magnification of your fathers or their magnification of their fathers. For Nazar Rajulam said, people are of two types, one of two types. Rajulun. Uh, one type of person is righteous, upright, and is valued in the sight of God. Uh, and the other person is um, a wicked, uh, wretched, wretched person who is insignificant in Allah's eyes. So all of you is from, each of you is from Adam, and Allah created Adam from dirt. 
And then this is said that this is the moment when the verse from Surah Hajarat was revealed, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nasa inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarim wa unza wa ja'annaakum shu'uban wa qaba'ilu li ta'arafu. Oh, mankind, oh, man, oh, man, oh, humanity, verily Allah created you from a male and female and made you into peoples and tribes in order that you come to know one another. In the Akramakum and Allah Isqaqum, the most noble of you in the sight of God, is those who are most dutiful to Him in the Allah Alim al Khabir. So this becomes considered as the occasion, uh, or an occasion where the verse is recited at least after its revelation. And, and, and the Prophet ﷺ is implying by saying that each of you is from Adam and Allah created Adam from dirt, that you people who brag and boast about your daddies, your fathers, and what they have done and achieved and what they were known for, then know that Adam is your daddy too. He's your father, right? And so if you have a problem with Bilal, then you have a problem with your dad. Because if anything, Bilal is more uh, akin or more resembles Adam than you, because it's like all of you are from Adam, you created Adam from dirt. So if you have a problem with dirt or things that are the color of dirt, <laughs> then you have a problem with your father. So how can you magnify your fathers, but then look down upon Bilal, Ibn Rabah? Well, at least that's, this is one way of reading the speech of the Prophet, alayhi salatu um, So in the pre-modern period, in the pre-modern period, um, or we say, uh, Prior to the Enlightenment, the onset, the onset of the European Enlightenment, race uh, was largely identified by culture, right? And, 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 and what I mean by that, in particular, things like shared language, shared customs, uh, shared beliefs, that that becomes the identifying factor of of race in the, in the pre-modern world. And for this very reason, when you actually look at the description of the Arabs, um, the electricographers, historians, they'll tell you that the غالب الوان عرب السمرة والأدمى that the, the predominant colors among the Arabs were light brown and dark brown. This is what you find, the electricographers say. And realistically what this means is that Movies like uh, The Message are actually whitewashed, literally, right? If that is true, right? Because you look at the, the message, and it's a beautiful movie, but if you're concerned with historical, historical accuracy, uh, then it doesn't present uh, it, you know, in that particular movie because most of the characters are people of white skin or very uh, fair skin, I would say. And, um, but most of the Arabs were brown and black. As a matter of fact, um, when we think of the pre-modern period too, with regard to discrimination, that the sensibilities we have about color in our times are much more, I guess you'd say, um, we have be much more hypersensitive about color than I would say that people were in the pre-modern period. Because for instance, um, the Arabs, they didn't see themselves as white people. Uh, but they also didn't see themselves as Africans. Uh, uh, if anything, uh, they saw themselves as being more akin to, to the African than they were to the European. And, uh, uh, but something happened in history which transformed the Arab phenotype from the darker color to the lighter color. And there's actually a hadith um, which uh, is related, I know Mam Suyuti relates it, uh, where he mentions that the Prophet ﷺ one day was having a conversation with Abu Bakr Siddiq after he had had a dream. He had a dream. The Prophet had this dream. And so he tells Abu Bakr about the dream. And in the dream he says, I saw myself in the dream being followed by a flock of black sheep. And the flock of black sheep were being followed by a larger flock of white sheep. But the white sheep became so numerous that I could no longer see the black sheep anymore. Abu Bakr's response to the hadith, or to the dream, according to this hadith, is that, Ya Rasulullah, the black sheep, they're the Arabs. And the white sheep are the, the non-Arabs who will eventually enter into Islam and they will outnumber us. Uh, and so the Prophet responded 
according to the Hadith, this is exactly the same interpretation that the angel Gabriel just gave to me. Right. So, if the Hadith is Sahih, but, but even, and even if it's not, it definitely does articulate what did happen historically. Because the Arabs, the original Arabs, were those of the peninsula itself, of Arabia. And so, most of the people that today were considered to be Arabs are Arabized people. Right. So, I mean... You know, according to this understanding and this interpretation, that means like people of Iraq, people of Syria, people of Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, you know, North, other parts of North Africa, and all the places, right, um, uh, which are identified as being Arab countries. That they people are Arabized people, right? Uh, there are Persians that also entered into 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 the mix as well, right? Who even took on the Arab. So, at any rate, the whole point is that. In those days, you could, it was easier to become the member of a race because race was largely cultural, right? So you either you have an Arab father, right? And you can trace your lineage back to Arabia that way, uh, 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 or you just simply uh, adopt, you, you, you adopt Arab culture. Anyway, so you start to, to learn language and you teach your children the language and then eventually over time, you become associated with the Arabs, or you become a called a Hadith or a Mola, right? that you make an alliance with them. You know, sometimes people just simply pop up, and this is the old world in general. Is that guy? He's, maybe he's running. He committed a murder in his tribe, and he was afraid to get killed and you know, justice to be dealt with. And what he does, he flees, and eventually he shows up in some village, some other village, and say, "Hey." Friends, <laughs> I'm lost. I'm a wanderer. I'm, I can't. Know, I don't know how to get back home. How, whatever he says to them, he enters into the village. And the village, they, they embrace the person, and then that person becomes one of their moadi, their clients. They become their allies, and, and so the individual becomes an Arab, or becomes whatever other tribe or group of people that you're talking about. Right? So it's easier for you to become those things in the old days. So we even think about, for instance, the authors of the six major books of Hadith. Like Imam Bukhari, where was he from? Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. All right. So is that an Arab country? Okay, it's not an Arab country. Right. But what people generally have in our minds of Imam Bukhari was, a, was an Arab. Uh, Abu Dawood is from Sizistan, right? Um, Ibn Majah is from Kazween. Uh, Imam Tirmidh is from Tirmidh. Right. So you have to say, you, these are Persians, right? Persian people, but they become identified with the Arabs, right? Because it was easy to, uh, to, 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 um, to become incorporated into someone's group or their collective. Right? After Enlightenment, something else happens, which is that we we people start to identify races with particular colors. But even before coming to that, I did want to mention uh, something about about Arabness to show you that it was this wasn't about color to, to, to bring it out. Amar ibn Yasir, we know Amar ibn Yasir, right? Allah Arab, Arab man, right? Okay, right. How do we know he's an Arab? His name. His father, right? Yasir, right? Yasir ibn Amr was his father. He's an Arab man, right? His where's his mother from? Sumeya, Sumeya, where's Sumeya? Who's Sumeya? Where's she from? She's Habash, right? She's Ethiopian, she's Abyssinian, right? right? But his Arab authenticity was in question. Now he was persecuted. He's one of the persecuted members of, 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 the, uh, of, that, of that period. But it wasn't because he was black, right? Some people say it was because his mother was black, that's why he was persecuted. No, that wasn't why. He was persecuted because his father originally came from Yemen, right? And so his father ended up in. Uh, the Hijaz, because he and two of his other brothers, they left Yemen in search of a fourth brother who was missing. Uh, two, his two brothers went back to Yemen, but he remained himself. And when he remained, he had to form a, an alliance with one of the local Arab tribes, right, in order to, for protection, right. So it's a Hadith, right. So so Yasser himself becomes a Hadith there, right. So once they become Muslim, then it's something like an act of betrayal. You've broken your allegiance with us, right. So they are persecuted because of that. They don't have a tribe to protect them. Right? They don't have a tribe to, to protect them. Amr ibn Al's Arab, right? 
All right. His mother was from where? Abyssinia. Huh? Abyssinia. No, she was Abyssinian too. His mother was also Abyssinian. Nobody questioned Amr ibn As's authenticity. He was from the chieftains, one of the leaders of the Arabs. All right. He, he got his person, he, and you look at his description, brown skin. Amr ibn Yasser, brown skin. Uh, 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 Amr ibn As, he opens up Egypt. And then his brother, Uqba ibn Nafi, he opens up the rest of North Africa, for the most part. You know, what we call the, the portion we refer to as Ifriqiyah. Yes? Now, Uqba ibn Nafi shared a mother with Amr ibn As. So both of them had the same mother from, 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 from Ethiopia, who is, we call it. So, so if we consider a black person to be any person who has African blood, right, quote unquote, or looks like they have African blood, then instead of saying that the Arabs invaded North Africa, they sound like black people. It sound like, it sound like we're saying that Black people invaded Africa and opened up and conquered North Africa. Right? You follow me? Um, when you actually look at the, the description of Bilal ibn Murbah, an, and you compare his description to Osama ibn Zayd, and then in some description, even Zayd ibn Haritha, that when you, when you look at the description, you'll get the impression that that Bilal ibn Murbah was an Arab because we have a certain idea of what Arabs are supposed to look like. Because, for instance, Osama ibn Zayd and Zayd ibn Haditha in certain narrations are described as having pudgy noses. Hatfas, right? They had fatas feet. That, you know, it's a flat nose. You look at the description of Bilal ibn Murbah, he's described as having an aquiline, aquiline, aquiline uh, nose. He's ajna. You know, so meaning that the, the, the bridge of his nose was high up. Look up, aquiline when you get a chance. Aquiline nose, right? So the top is, so it's like that, you know, a lot of times we, oh, he has an Arab nose. You look at this and, and you consider certain things that are said about Bilal. Like we know that his father's name is Robach. A minority opinion at least alludes to the possibility that his father was an Arab, but the stronger view is like Baladri, uh, um, the author, in Sabin Ashraf, that he says his, Rubak, his father was also a slave and his mother, Hamama, and you know, Sukaina, was also, both of them were slaves, and so Bilal was born in Mecca, born and raised in Arabia. Some, some say in Mecca, some say another part of Arabia, but definitely he was born and raised in Arabia. Now, you, sometimes you hear people say that, okay, well, Bilal struggled uh, to say, speak Arabic. Right? He had a strong accent. And the basis of that, 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 that belief is, is actually a fabricated hadith which says, uh, inna, inna, inna and Allah. Um, that Bilal's seen is a sheen in Allah's eyes. Because they said that he, when he said the uh, adhan, he would say, Ashadu Allah, not Ashadu, it said, Ashadu Allah, ilaha illallah. But actually, the hadith is fabricated. There's no reason to believe. Ibn Kathir and other scholars have fabricated hadith. Ibn Kathir said Bilal was the most eloquent of people. One of the most eloquent. He even has his own poetry. Bilal ibn Murbah has his own poetry. Bilal ibn Murbah, uh, he, was, he was born and raised in Arabia. There's no reason to think that he himself actually spoke with an accent. So he was probably more culturally Arab than he was even African for that reason. Um, on the other hand, you have someone like Suhaib al-Rumi. Now, a lot of people know about Suhaib al-Rumi is that he really wasn't Roman. I mean, in the sense that he was Greek. He wasn't a Greek. He actually was Arab. Suhaib so al-Rumi was, was, was born of an Arab father. And his father and his uncle used to work for the Persians at the border uh, with, with the Byzantine Empire. And when, when Suhaib was a little boy, 
the Persians invaded and they took them. They, they abducted him and took him and he raised him in Rome. Right? So when he grew up, he sort of he lost the ability to articulate Arabic in the normal fashion. So eventually he made his way back to Arabia. And, and he understood Arabic, but he wasn't very eloquent. So Suhaib wrote, for instance, the story is told about once Umar al Khattab, he visits Suhaib on his estate. And as Suhaib is, uh, he sees Umar al Khattab and one of the young Sahaba approaching, he yells out and says, Yanas, Yanas! Right. So Umar al Khattab says, I go, La Abullah. They said, oh, it's like, was it what, like, what, what's, what's wrong with him? Is it, why is it, why is he called the people? Yanas. You think he said, Yanas, Yanas. Oh, people, oh, people. Well, that's not the way you welcome somebody. Say, oh, people, oh, people. But the individual who was accompanying Umar al Khattab said to him, said, no, 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 that's not what he's saying. He's saying, Yohannas, Yohannas, which is the name of his servant. He's trying to say the name of it. He couldn't say, he had trouble speaking, but from a point of lineage, Suhaib al-Rumi was an Arab because his father was an Arab. Bilal, from a point of lineage, was not because his father was not an Arab, but he was more eloquent than Suhaib al-Rumi for, for this reason. Right? So, so fundamentally, again, coming back to the issue of race in the modern world, so now we, we live in a time where eventually we start to think of race and race classifications um, in, the t in terms of, 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 of color. And one particular scholar is extremely crucial in this particular regard. This is a Swedish man known as Carl Linnaeus now, in the 17th century. Um, 17th, more well, closer to the 18th century. So, so Carl Linnaeus, he was the very first person to, to talk about races in terms of color. So he actually said that there are four human races. Now there are many different theories about race. You, know, you have some people say there are 64 races, and some of them are less than that. You know, there's all types of khilaf, you know, but this is an attempt to make race, um, the, the race studies into a type of science. It's like a pseudoscience. So people wanted to, they, from zoology, starts in zoology, and then they transfer it to to now we're going to classify people as well. So he said there are four races. You know, the white, the, the white, the yellow, the red and black. White, yellow, and red and black races. So the white race, um, well, Linnaeus, his, what wasn't, it wasn't so much that the four races were novel, but what really was novel about his idea was that he fundamentally he associated certain types of behaviors and, and motivations with color, uh, certain types of temperaments. So, if he would say, so for instance, he said about whites, the whites are, we call they, they're sanguine. Right? They're sanguine people. Fundamentally, just another way of saying that they're very balanced and they're happy people. They're, you know, they, uh, they're, um, when they do things, or they, they do things according to custom. Right, so custom itself implies, suggests a certain amount of rationality uh, involved uh, in the decisions that those people, those two people make. So they're like they sort of balance people. The the yellow people, he said about them that they were um, melancholy, right? Which is just another way of saying sad. So think about the yellow people. It's like yellow people, like Chinese, right? You know, East, Far Eastern people, right? You know, so you see, China, they don't smile very much, right? So they're sad people. They must be sad. <laughs> they don't smile very much. Think, you know, so this is sort of stereotypes developing. So he said, so they're 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 they're, they're melancholy and they're motivated by belief. Again, another way of saying superstition. Right? Right. Uh, the the, the uh, red people, he said they're choleric, which is a fancy word for quick to anger. So we all grew up with Zorro, with Zorro and, and, and what is the uh, Long uh, Ranger, Long Ranger and, 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 you know, and, Sun, you know, and Cisco Kid and, right, and those old movies and uh, Charles Brunson and you have even Clint Eastwood would sometimes, you know, they have the 
Indians, we called them Indians growing up, the Native Americans, right? How they portrayed in those old movies, those old westerns, right? Yes. They're, you say, savage. They're people, they're constantly out to get us. What are they doing? They're, they're ah! trying to scalp somebody, right? Invade their vill village, you know? Um, so they're choleric. They're angry people, right? And they're motivated by habit, right? So again, more inferiority, the idea that, listen, okay, they do what they think, it's not, it's like, they don't even think about it so much. It's like, it's just, listen, I'm just so used to doing this, I can't stop doing it. It's almost like an addiction, right? It's habit, habit, and motivated by the habit, the habit. and then the, the, those at the bottom, again, are the, so he says, the blacks. And the blacks are motivated, they say the, the blacks are uh, phlegmatic people. You know, fancy way of saying, lazy. So, uh, and they are motivated by instinct, right? Instinct, right? So it's like animals are motivated by instinct, right? So it's, so it's, hey, well, you know, you get a feeling, you feel lustful, I got to do something with that, right? You understand? Pounce on somebody, right? So instinct, right? So Carl Linnaeus is, is, is largely responsible for many of the stereotypes that developed regarding the different types of people. And then after him, there's Johann, the, a German guy, Blumenbach, who added the brown race, the Malaya, uh, people of, uh, uh, of Malaya. Um, and then there are other things as well. So, so is at any rate, what's important about this, I would say, is just that we should understand how ideas about race have been in flux for a very long time. And even so today, for instance, if I was to go to, well, many of us were to go to somewhere like Brazil. Like in America, we have the one drop rule. So the one drop rule, which is that, you know, any amount of African blood, or sub-Saharan African blood, you know, uh, even if you look white, if it's discovered, you're not white anymore, you're black, right? Uh, and Brazil is the opposite of that, which is that any amount of European blood, you're no longer black. You're no longer black. So many of us would go to Brazil or even Haiti and say that, well, I'm black. He said, no, you're not. You're not Negro. You're not Negro. Right. Um, so even in our world today, well, we, and we know this too when we go to the Muslim world. You go to the Muslim world. It's the same thing. You, we go there and ideas about color and race, they, they differ. So, so, we, so there's, there's a tendency, especially among black Americans, and what I mean by black Americans, I don't mean those who recently immigrated from Africa. I'm talking about those who have a historical connection to the, the land itself through slavery and, and things like that. Uh, that there's a tendency of many of us to, to assume that every black person throughout the world has had the same experience vis-a-vis -vis vis-a-vis Europeans, and that also every European person is the same, right? Um, but it's not, it's not true. It's not, it's not the case. Um, so, so when we find someone coming here from Nigeria or coming from Sudan or, or Somalia, whatever it may be, the moment we hear from them something that doesn't seem to be as much in support of the mission, right, of the people, or they're not standing with the people, right? that we automatically say, oh, sell out, coon, this and that. We say, well, why, why can't it simply be they had a different experience? Right? Maybe they don't see themselves as members of the same race, you see. Uh, they may acknowledge that, yes, there's something similar about us, but we didn't, haven't had the same experience. Right? So why don't expect me to have the same passion that you, you, that you do. Don't expect me to, to share the same assumptions that you, that, that you have. Right? So, 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 and I, I found this much more among black Americans who, in particular those perhaps are, are less um, aware of the diversity, cultural diversity that exists, and even among people from the Caribbean, like the blacks from the Caribbean as well, they don't see themselves in the same light that we, that we see, see them. Right? 
Um, so, so, so before, uh, I know that some people probably have some questions. I wanted to read a couple of passages from the, from the book. Let's see if I can find my first one. Sorry about this, my mic is on Yeah, if you were asleep, you're awake now. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. All right, so we'll try this again. So this is, uh, I'm going to read something from the, the chapter entitled Race, Pre- and Post-Enlightenment. Maybe a little bit too loud now, I think, because I have to keep it all the way back here. And this little hum, little buzz back there. Um, the election of the first African-American president provoked some to allege America to be a post-racial society. A number of discriminatory events, however, have belied that claim, proving that many Americans still have not cast off the shackles of racism. Muslim immigrants to the United States often neglect to consider the critically important perceptions of race prevailing amongst the original constitutive members of the country, whites and blacks. The fact that race is no longer an important criteria for American citizenship does not mean that the psycho-emotional vestiges of the 1790 Naturalization Act, which stipulated that only free whites could legally become citizens, and the subsequent 1924 Racial Integrity Act, which redefined whiteness and outlawed cohabitation with non-whites, have vanished. Though linguists, though linguists differ over when exactly or when precisely and whence the word race entered the English language, what is clear is that for much of its history, it was utilized as nothing more than a merely convenient way of speaking of biophysical difference between people. Taxonomies which underscore difference in skin, skin pigmentation, nose shape and lip size, and hair texture were never truly meant to imply permanent primordial or degenerative physiological types until the 18th century Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus. According to the British American anthropologist Ashley Montague, the development of the idea of race may clearly be traced from scholastic naturalization of Aristotle's doctrine of the predicables of genus, species, difference, property, and accident. From thence, it may be directly traced to the early days of the Age of Enlightenment when Linnaeus in 1735 took over the concepts of class, species, and genus from the theologians to serve him as systematic tools. The term race was actually first introduced into the literature of natural history by Buffon, uh, who in the year 1749 used it to describe six groups of men. The term really represented an extension of the Aristotelian conception of species. That is to say, it was a subdivision of species. Buffon recognized that all human beings belonged to a single species, as did Linnaeus, and he considered it merely convenient and I emphasize the word convenient, as did Blumenbach after him, to distinguish between certain geographic groups of man. Thus, at the very outset, the term was understood to be pur purely arbitrary and a simple convenience, unquote. Throughout human history, societies have been adopt uh, throughout human history, societies have adopted criteria for corporate ethnic identification. Maybe just turn this off. Um, throughout human history, societies have adopted criteria for corporate ethnic identification. The racialization of a given population can occur on the basis of shared language and culture, while race in other populations is strongly attached to skin color and phenotype. <coughs> Pre-enlightenment and old world cultures have largely adopted language-based language -based, right, racial, racialism, while colorism color-based racialism became an extremely important basis for racial distinction after the Middle Ages in the New World and, most importantly, in present-day America. 
The idea that shared language is crucial to racial construction is further emphasized in Islamic history by the very fact that it was used as the basis for the Arabization of non-Arab peoples. Non-Arabians seeking inclusion into Arabness merely needed to appropriate Arab language and culture. As a matter of fact, this criteria for Arabness is clearly articulated in a non-canonical but popular tradition which purports that the Prophet Muhammad said, whoever speaks, Arab, whoever speaks Arabic is an Arab. Consequently, the Levantine Arabs, Iraqis, and those of North Africa were eventually incorporated into Arabness. To quote Audrey Smedley about color-based conceptions of the word race, she says, it was intricately linked with certain presuppositions of thought held by European colonists from the 16th to the 18th centuries. During that period, the word was transformed in the, in the English language from a mere classificatory term of biophysical variation into a folk idea. This idea expressed certain attitudes towards human differences as well as prejudgments about the nature and social value of, of these differences. In other words, Linnaeus' innovation beyond his quadripart type division of human populations into white, yellow, red, and black was that he was assigned, that is, was that he assigned particular behavioral and temper, temperamental characteristics to each color based upon the four humors. The best of these characteristics were assigned to those who, with white skin, white supremacy, and the, and, and, and the worst were associated with those with black skin, related to black inferiority. This was followed in the 19th century by the Aryan master race theory of the French aristocrat, Arthur de Gobineau, along with the evolutionism of Charles Darwin, who likewise entertained deeply racist ideas about non-whites, especially about the Negro. What is important, from all, what is important for all to understand from this is that the Muslim American experience no matter how removed we may appear to be from America's barbarous past, has and still suffers from the politics of race in American society. The overtly racist policies of Jim Crow segregation, assassination, political disenfranchisement, and economic suppression may, no, may, may no longer be clearly visible. The psychological vestiges of earlier centuries, however, still pervade in American society and play a major role in many key decisions that affect the lives of ethnic minorities. This is because, as Matthew, as, Matt, as Matthew Fry Jacobson said, race is not just a conception, race is not just a conception, it is also a perception. Similarly, he says, because racial classifications so successfully masquerade as features of the natural landscape, they are seldom commented upon, com uh, seldom commented upon overtly. Once I am convinced of my superior, superior or inferior status and teach my offspring those lessons implicitly or explicitly, there is no longer a need to continue to publicly promote the idea. This is because the post-colonial mindset relieves the colonialists from the need to physically subjugate and control the given population. The colonial subject, in this case, self-regulates his or her own inferior status. So that was one um, quote. I, I wanted to share another section. And this relates to examples of some of the um, hadith which exist in our, in our literature about, um, about blacks. That's where I can find it. So you got some little stickers, right? <laughs> Uh, that one. All right, here we go. So this is under a section from the chapter entitled Perceiving Black Through Arab Eyes. And the question I'm asking here is, that, did, Prophet Muhammad, did Prophet Muhammad have anything to say about blacks? Bilal al Rabah is one of the most famous and important personalities in Islamic history. At the start of the Prophet's mission, he was an Abyssinian slave who had the great misfortune to serve a cruel chieftain by the name Umayyad bin Qala. Upon hearing the Prophet's message, Bilal accepted Islam during his captivity. According to Muslim history, the exemplary companion Abu Bakr Siddiq purchased Bilal's freedom after finding Bilal's torture no longer bearable to watch. Bearable to watch. Umayyad attempted to force Bilal to renounce his newly found faith. Bilal refused to recant, repeating with what remaining breath he could muster the words ahad, ahad, one, one, defiantly, refusing to acknowledge the Mecca pantheon. This story brought Bilal great prestige in the annals of Muslim history and has, has served for more than a millennia, a more than a millennium, as a hallmark of Islam's cultural and ethnic diversity. 
That being so, it would seem uncharacteristic for the Prophet Muhammad to declare as reported by certain tradition is that the black person belongs to his stomach and private part. There is no good in Abyssinians, or that the worst slave is the Negro. Similarly, it is reported that he said, Seek out the good seed among you, and marry compatible mates, but avoid the Negro, for verily he is a dysmorphic creature. Bilal clearly saw the truth of God and great hope in Islam. He was, after all, ready to give his life for his beliefs, even when the Prophet Muhammad had very few supporters. It would seem that uncharacteristic of the Prophet to remark so disparagingly about Bilal's people, especially when the Quran exposed the Prophet for his magnificent ethos, characterizes him as a mercy to all creation, and cautions him that if you had been harsh or hard-hearted, they would have dispersed and left you. What could be harsher and more alienating than telling someone that there is no good in him, or that he was a freak of nature? The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is also alleged to have said, a black person steals when he is hungry and fornicates when he is sated. Similarly, he is accused of having said, buy slaves and share your earnings with them, but avoid the Negro because they have short lifespans and meager sustenance. The scholar Ibn Qayyim al said, the hadith which disparage Abyssinians and blacks are all fabrications. The Hadith, the Hanafi scholar Mullah Ali Qari concurred with his view in his Mubu'ats. Centuries before, the humble scholar Abdul Rahman ibn Jawzi listed them as examples of spurious hadiths in his famous work under a similar title. Similarly, the late Salafi scholar Muhammad Nasruddin al Abani graded them as fabricated and weak. In his Subsidus al Hadith al Ba'ifa wa Mubu'a, he said, after objecting to Imam Suyuti's authentication of hadith, don't speak to me of the blacks, the black person belongs to his stomach and, genit and genitals, Al-Bani says, how could it be thought that this divinely revealed moral code would berate the entire community of blacks when among them are those who are God-fearing, upright, and chaste, just like other communities? And I wish I knew what the position of the non-Muslim among the blacks would be if this universal disparagement of the sons of his race were the, uh, if, uh, and I wish I knew what the position of the non-Muslim among the blacks would be, if this universal disparagement of the sons of his race by the divinely revealed moral code of Islam had reached him. End quote. Shaykh al -Aban. So I mean, so you get some of, some uh, some glimpse into the issues that uh, that uh, I tried to deal with and, and, and cover in the book. Um, I think I've been talking for about an hour, and, and I'd really like to um, like to talk an hour and open things up for Q and A. And if we if we progress, we still have some time. And if if, if you are interested in, in reading any other section from the book, I shall take time off of that. So so that I'll just conclude there for now. And so if there are any questions, uh, this now is your time to to ask. Me. Uh, according to what you just explained to us, that uh, the Arabs during that time were, as you said, brown or dark brown. Then how did it, at what point did it flip over? And how, and how was it uh, forgotten what, what they were? And, you know, in other words, how was it so accepted, you know, that there was other, otherwise? When it was just like maybe now it's a long time ago, 14 years ago, but back then it might have been two or three hundred years. That information shouldn't have been. I mean, even if, if the information was put out, that was propaganda, false ID, etc. How, how come um, their, their true identity? How did it get lost and wasn't maintained? Well, I mean, it's it's. Well, I wouldn't say difficult, but to to know for certain what happened. It's hard to make the claim that this is exactly what happened, but we do have some indications of of what did occur. And if we consider it a fact that kings have a major influence on the masses in terms of what um, is deemed to be something good to pursue and what's not then I do think that the fact that 
if you look at the the dynasty of Ben Abbas, the Abbasid dynasty, when they were in Baghdad in particular, what we find is that there was a custom of each of the Khulafa, the custom to actually give uh, to turn over rule or power to the son of the concubine. Right. So you hear words called Harun al Rashid and mm -hmm. others like this. Harun al Rashid was the <coughs> son of the concubine of his father. Right. So, 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 and then uh, about up to a, a minimum of 50 rulers after that. And actually, Mams Yuti outlines this, he sort of brings this out in his Tariq al Khulafa. He actually he, he goes through each one of them. He said, so and so, his mother was so and so, and she was from this ethnic background. She's from this ethnic And so, what we find is that the overwhelming majority of those women was a member of a race that we today would consider to be a white race uh, Armenian, Turkish, Persian. Uh, and you find a couple of them, you find a Hindu-like Arab, you know, an Ethiopian woman, you know, they're not that many, but overwhelming majority, out of 50, you have maybe two or three which actually would identify with the black race. Right? Um, so, but even going back to the Umayyad dynasty, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan is a statement that Ibn Qayyim Jawziyah reports in his Akhbar uh, al where Abdul Malik ibn Marwan he says, uh, paraphrasing him, that if you want, if you want to seek, if, if you seek, or if you want a woman for sexual gratification, then choose a Berber woman. If you want a woman for a wife, choose a Persian woman. If you want one for domestic service, choose a Greek woman. Right. So, so again, kings and, and rulers have an influence on the masses. So, so if kings start a competition and say, well, who's going to write the best poem? Who's going to you understand? These they have cultural influence as well, right? So we can so, so we talk so this is Ban Umayya, and then we see into Ban Abbas that there is this somewhat custom of we call I like to call the whitening of the Arabs or the Arab sort of public image sort of developed. I think it goes back to around this time. Uh, but the Arabs it's very clear that the Arabs who they considered to be white were not themselves. The Arabs referred to they considered white the Persians. Syrians and the and the and the Romans, the Byzantines, those are the whites. And as a matter of fact, they didn't even call them white people, they called them red people. So anytime you find a hadith that has the word red, it actually means white. <laughs> and it's talking about a person, you know, this person was a red person, means white person, person with white skin. The reason they did not to call like to call people white, even people who were not Arabs, was because white was a negative characteristic for them. You can call them white was a bad thing. Because to say that you're Abya meant that you have what's called the Delilah, right? So you've seen some of our, you know, you know my mother, Barhamah, that she suffered from Delilah when there's multiple people. I mean, you have discoloration in your, you're losing the melanin in your skin. There are spots, white spots in your skin, right? So, and that which further corroborates the claim that Arabs were people, we would say people of color, people with melanin, melanated people, right? Right? Uh, because generally you don't think about that, you think of people with pale skin or white skin, you know, but they get the libel, how can you really tell? Right? It's hard to tell, right, that they, that they actually suffered from that. So, so, so they generally did not like even call, they like to call themselves or other people white as a description of the skin color. If they call a person white, either it was because they were trying to um, praise or extol the person's um, virtues, their characteristics. Right? So if you're a generous person or other, you're a white person in terms of your character. Right? It's a metaphor. Or it was as Imam al said that when, when the Arabs called one another white, meaning the color of the person's skin, he said it meant alone, that the person was wheat color, the color of wheat. Right? So Abiyat was the word used to, to refer to the color of wheat. Uh, at any rate, you know, that was the majority of the Arabs, light and, and dark brown. And some of them were black, we were generally called black as well. Um, uh, but the minority of them, what we call white. Right? It's a matter of the hadith of, um, 
And this is fabricated in Hadith as well, where it says the Prophet referred to Aisha, called out to Aisha and said, Ya Amira, O little red one. Because it was said that Aisha, or the Anha, was, had very, you know, her skin was more inclined towards um, Syrian, Persian type of skin. Right? But the Hadith is a fabricated Hadith in spite of that, uh, you know, in spite of that, that's the thing that made a Um so, so I believe that what happened was, um, again, as a dream, as it's related, that the, the Arabs will become outnumbered by the non Arabs. And since it was easy to be incorporated into Arabness, right, through the adoption of the, of the language and, and the culture, among other things, and people just say, no, I'm an Arab. So you didn't see it as, like, we think of like a biological thing, you know. It's just all, no such thing like pure Arab. I mean, if, 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 to make this a claim, I mean, you know, you would, I mean, the Prophet himself, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is he? He's from Adnan. And Adnan goes back to Ismail. Ismail, who was he? Was he an Arab? No. Right, his mother, what was she? Mm -hmm. right, so, yeah, so his mother, right, we know, was, was Egyptian, right? She's a dark woman. Uh, so, so, where's the pure, Purity come from? Where does it originate? You see, you know, so, so fundamentally, it's okay, where you all are from this area, you all share language, you share custom, you have similar experiences vis-a-vis -vis -vis other people, so you're one people. You constitute a race. But what type of race are you? You're a cultural race. It just so happens that most of you are this color. You know, but something happens, a shift happens. Time goes by, and then you know, most of you become the other color. Because so many people have joined <laughs> that race. You can join the race, right, in the, in the old days. When we think of race today, it's like, we can't just join the race. Even the definition of blackness in our, own, in our own time. But black people didn't say, okay, well, if you have this amount of African blood, then you're a black person. White people said that. <laughs> so we just simply embraced it. He said, okay, all right, you define us. We're not going to define ourselves. But we're going to embrace your definition of us, right? So any person has this amount of, of, of African blood, then you are you are you're black. Uh, so it's 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 not easy to, to pin down. There's, there's a lot of cultural constructivism involved here. Right? There, there's there, the cultural factors is from, from, from the outside imposing upon us ideas about ourselves. And so we just have to be careful not to internalize all of the negative things associated with being black or being whatever, being Arab or being Mexican or being, you know, because so, you know, so, the things that, uh, whoever controls the imagery um, gets, to define, gets to define, right, for everyone else what everyone is, right, you know, so this, I believe, like, the Hadith of the Prophet so long, uh, is actually ap applicable to the media in Hollywood, you know, there's a Hadith where it says, uh, that uh, those among those with the uh, harshest punishment on Yom Kippur are the image makers. I think it's talking about. I think the Hadith is a direct reference to the media, Hollywood, any anything, anybody projecting the imagery, right? And, and it becomes leaves the impressions on our minds, especially these negative associations, right? That that are made with you know the, the Arab terrorist, the black you know gang gang banger, the 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 Latino. Uh, drug smugglers, drug smuggler. You understand? So it's there, this, the idea is reinforced. Right? So these people will have a, a, a serious punishment on the They have something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared, prepared for them, in my, in my view. You know, I mean, even you know, the old white Jesus, again, the imagery, the impression that leaves in the mind, <laughs> the impression that leaves in the mind, and how it debilitates and it, and it slows people down and internalizes inferiority because of that type of imagery. You know, so I believe that this is a real danger of image making, right? Of iconography, iconography. You know that this is the real danger of that. And so, so that's why we, we should, even when people make movies, we should insist that they give us as much historical accuracy as possible. You know, like the message, for instance. Again, that's just one movie. Or like you know, the Ten Commandments, right? <laughs> right? So you have these movies that they say, well, say, yeah, well, anybody should be able to play whoever they want. Yes and no. <laughs> you know, why are you so obsessed about race? No, I'm not obsessed about race. I'm obsessed about historical accuracy. 
because I don't want to give the, the wrong impression, right? That, that, you know, even, of course, superheroes are not real people to begin with, you know, but we know what that does too. All the superheroes look one way, and everyone else, oh man, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, you said that if uh, Kaim O. Josie mm -hmm. had mentioned that any hadith that's depicting uh, black or the Arabs are being black or the Prophet Swahili was so now it's fabricated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fabricated. Mm -hmm. right. so, that mean, so that would mean a number of hadith is in Sahih Muslim that was explained by Imam Nawawi would be fabricated. Such as? Such as the, the hadith, such as the hadith uh, by Jabba ibn Abdullah. He said any, any hadith disparaging blacks. Disparaging blacks. It's right, the same, it's, it's, the negative, speaking negatively. Is speaking negatively. Right, exactly. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, um, what was the connection that a lot of the, now I don't know how to describe this. <laughs> <laughs> the Zanj. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, historical connection, or, or what kind of connection did, did people outside of people who were describing the Zanj? What kind of connections were they coming in contact with the Zanj? Were there researchers that were going into certain parts of Africa and saying, okay, and finding the Zanj and these cannibalistic people, or were they? How were they coming in in contact to make these type of uh, Assessments and analysis. I mean, some of it. I mean, some of it apparently, uh, 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 apparently is is research. Uh, I mean, explorers, people who are travelers. Uh, some of it seems to be simply borrowing from other writers, other individuals, perhaps have gone to these places. Um, but there's a history called Abu al whose author is unknown, which is written. I think it was fourth century, Islamic century. Uh, but it describes the Zunj and some of the bordering tribes, such as the Zavage and then the people of Habesha. And when he describes, the author describes uh, the, the, the Zunj, she describes them as, as Christ, dark. These are, these are all in one section of like those people of very dark black skin. And he mentions the Zunj as people with no clothing, they're cannibals. Um, and he also said that there are no Muslims there. Then when he talks about people, Zavage was a little bit further to the north, said these are people that are half clothed. Um, there are some Muslims who live there. <laughs> like, and, and they communicate with them, they have a connection with Muslims. And then they go to Hamasha and they praise the Abyssinians, the Ethiopians, and talk about how attractive they are, how peace loving they are, right? They're fully clothed. You know, and there are many Muslims that connection with many Muslims and Muslim, Muslim lands. Now, some of that could be the in the interest of the writer to fundamentally give the impression that, because this was the old climatic theory, uh, which was fundamentally uh, linked to <coughs> the idea that the center of the world is the Mediterranean. Even the word Mediterranean is about like you know happening in the middle, right? This idea of the area of the middle of the, of the earth, middle earth, right? And so it is the place where you find the most civilized people, the most cultured people, the most industrious people, right? And so and the further you get away from the middle of the earth, uh, the less civilized you become, right? The less civilized you become. So, so, so speaking of these, 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 these people in this fashion could just simply be based on a bias, that those writers had to reinforce this idea that okay, well, the further away, to the further to the south, right? So they're at least civilized. They're not going to have much, as much uh, clothing. Um, uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun also talks about this, and, but he imputes he, he, he imputes to the people to the extreme north similar things they impute to the people of the extreme south, right? So, so the Slavs. Right, the Slavic peoples of the, of the extreme north, he says similar things about what he says to those of the extreme south. Right? So again, he believes in the climatic um, theory. Right? That, okay, and of course, climate has an effect on your industriousness, uh, has an effect on uh, level of civilization, um, among other things. Right? So, so unless you come towards the center, you're going to be less civilized. Right? But I'm not ready also to concede that there is not some truth there, 
and what has been reported, because it's hard to prove or disprove, I guess you would say. Yes, no. So, so, um, mm -hmm. so, so we know we know that uh, that uh, you know race, you know, as, as essentialization, biological essentialization, right? Uh, seen either through you know phenotype, right, yeah. and then you know gi uh, given a connection in terms of you know internal capacities and you know the possibilities of the individual. Mm -hmm. We know that you know its relationship to to post enlightenment, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that race before that is is, is something which is you know rather cultural. Right, so all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you were talking about the Maliki school yeah. and this classification of noble mm -hmm. and ignoble, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So in terms of that classification and stating that, that, uh, that, that here, the, the usage of black uh, mm -hmm. is, is, not, is not what we would consider today black, right? It's mm -hmm. not right. biologization, right? Mm -hmm. right? Or naturalization, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, but it rather designates some, some particular, some either, either a historical fiction, right? Uh, or, or a group of people, a mm -hmm. specific group of people. Right. How does that affect? Uh, the, how does that affect the people that are under the school of uh, of Medina? Yeah. Right. How does that affect people in terms of phenotype? In terms of you know just uh, franchisement, disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. So what woman are they speaking to? Who are yeah. they concretizing? That's a good question. Why? And this is an important question because this is actually the only point where I depart from the earlier thesis. Because it would seem to me to be a transhistorical disdain for blackness, and in particular the sub-Saharan black. Right? So when you find in hadith mention of black person, 99% of the time you're talking about someone who's African, either Nubian or Ethiopian, someone something like that. Um, and the same thing with in the, the Malcolm School. When they say black, they're talking about African. They talk about Sub-Saharan African. Uh, so, so in that sense, it is a disenfranchisement, at least a policy. And again, this is not to say, and I, I try to make this clear, that not all the Maliki scholars accepted this view as valid. Many of them actually pushed back and said, no, that all women are the same, we treat them the same, that every woman has to have a guardian, and that they have a blood relative who's alive, who's a guardian, and that person has given priority over the woman's marriage, you know, given more authority over women than a non relative, right? And just these other scholars, and they actually come to some of the mainstream books, they mentioned that, okay, well, if she's Dania, which in the black women have to be one of them, one of the, another Dania we call the ignoble woman would be, they call the Musalmanita, which is a reference to a, a non attractive non Arab woman, who's not an African, right? And so generally we talk about Persian or other like that, Turkish, or, so she's undesirable. So, so, so you find in the in the uh, the black Maliki countries, or the African Sub-Saharan African Maliki countries, that naturally just push that. Right? So one particular author he goes on to say that well, if we were to accept this premise as as true, that by simply being black, right, a black woman, that she she has all this freedom to do things uh, that other women, more valued women, are not able to do, then what does that say about the Ahl al-Bayt, the, the, the members of the prophetic household where he's from Sudan, in this country, were all black. So you're going to tell me that they are a noble people? You're not going to tell me that, no, these people are shuraka, these are nobles, right? So, so there is pushback in the school itself. Uh, and so it's some, an, an acknowledgement that these factual assumptions are not shared between one group and another. And so you find that generally Malik is from Andalus, right, who we assume to be lighter skinned people, uh, or the North Africa, Maghreb, Tunisia, you know, generally we assume to be lighter skinned peoples, that these are the scholars who would, or Egypt as well, especially Egypt, because I look at a lot of scholars from Egypt. Uh, that you find this actually being a norm or normative teaching among them, but not among the black African, uh, black sub Saharan African nations. You don't find the same sort of, uh, sort, sort of opinion promoted. So, so, it, so, so fundamentally, what it does is that if I, if I said to the woman that, oh, go right ahead and just choose whatever you want to to be your guardian, then what that meant for men back then, and perhaps even so today, is that. Um, 
you're not really worth much to anything, right? because things that are valuable, you protect them. Right? So we're going to remove the protection from you because nobody wants you. Right? You're not valuable. So they just rationalized it. They had a way to that they looked at this. They thought it was a moral thing to do. And, and perhaps one way what they thought was that, okay, since nobody wants this woman, we should make it easy for her to get married. Because if we don't, then nobody's going to marry her. They probably just thought that they were doing her a favor, doing that type of woman a favor in, 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 this, in doing this. Now it's hard to sort of <laughs> I think talk about this because of how sensitive the issue is. Today it's hard for people to take it in that way. But I, I wouldn't put it past them that this is actually what they were thinking of. If you find books on slavery, for instance, scholars would say that, that if setting a slave free, some scholars, you know, if setting a slave free would lead to the slave harming him or herself, it is not permissible for you to set the slave free. <laughs> right? So say if the slave is extremely old and they can't take care of themselves, they can't go out and make a living on their own. That you'll find scholars who say, well, no, no, you can't set the slave free because they're going to harm them. So we have to protect the weak. So it's, so it's like slavery in this case is looked look upon as a type of protection for those people. And again, it seems hard for us to, to really wrap our heads around it because of all of the sensibilities that exist about slavery and blackness and so many other things today. But people uh, saw themselves as living in a very moral world. It was a very, very moral world that um, that promoted a certain type of goodness and a type of fairness, a type of protectionism, right? As maternalistic, of course, in, in, in nature in the past. So, so I mean, hopefully, does that you know, pretty much answer? Something like that. Any other? We want to come back to the book. Are we ready to sign the book? <laughs> More? More? For the book Marie, three more? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I don't want to, like, fortunately, you don't want me to read more. <laughs> He's like, hey. I'm going to buy the book and read it. Might as well read it. Let me just find one more, one more reference and then. Uh, well, you're looking for that reference. Uh, yes. The, uh, mm -hmm. I, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about a statement that I read. It uh -huh. said, history is told by the person who won the war, mm -hmm. and the memoirs are written by the people who lost. So right. I'm thinking about when he first started talking, you mentioned the scholarly work that you're doing and how certain people have been disenfranchised mm -hmm. in yes. the analysis. You don't even hear their voice. They don't have a voice at all, mm -hmm. as if they don't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think you. <clears throat> Touched on some key points to help um, dispel that, but I think I see a lot of people saying, or taking the position of, uh, I don't want to mimic an Arab, mm -hmm. I want to see myself mm -hmm. as an Arab in the religion of Islam, so they don't, they don't want to dress like Arab, or, and I think again, the work that you're doing helps dispel. Mm -hmm. but look at some of these things, why it's a blessing that you're doing. But I want to say that how do you address? That mindset, first and foremost, and that you that 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 that, that, that concept exists. That people say they don't want to have anything to do with the religion because they see themselves as following these Arabs that have these racist views, <coughs> perceptions of them as a people, right. and also the concept of um, learning from the people who have been here in America, in North America first, mm -hmm. and our experience has been. Seen as um, people said they couldn't learn from that experience. So they, they don't see the value in it. And an example that I'm, I want to use is they talk about Emmett Till's mother's response mm -hmm. to seeing her son with the face being swollen. Mm -hmm. And they said, she said, I don't have a moment. Well, I can't hate. I just want to seek justice. Mm -hmm. And they said, that was a, that's the best response. And they said, America should have took that response when it came to terrorism. Mm -hmm. They said, I don't have any time to hate. I just want to seek justice. Yeah, right. And that came from the experience of the blues people, as they say. So. Mm -hmm. How can, can you speak on that? Well, the first issue was the great relationship to addressing the mindset of, uh, uh, we can call it an anti-Arab mindset among Muslims, is that, I mean, first of all, we have to, we have to embrace Islam, the Islamic teachings, first and foremost, and, and, and our teachings are not our teachers are not racist. You know. Now, Islam doesn't 
negate race or say that you know oh, there are no races. You're just one race. No, if anything, it embraces it. You know, We made you into Shu'ub and Qaba'a. So Allah did that. Right. So, so when you say that Allah is not a race, he is a race. He is a race. He is a race. He is a race. He He encourages us to embrace one another and to even give preference to our own relatives, those close to us. You know, which, you know, and they start with our blood and then they extend out to those who like us, you know, and our experiences and our races. There that is nothing wrong with that, you know, with what we can call ethnocentrism. So let's say friend people who, 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 for instance, they may might only want to marry within their own race, quote unquote, right? That doesn't necessarily make you racist. You know, they say, well, this is why I prefer. Right? I'm attracted to this. I'm not attracted to that, right? This is what I want to do. It's not necessarily racist, right? you see, for people to feel that way. Um, so, so, so we don't we don't negate race, but at the same time, we 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 we, we have to um, one. Keep in mind that if we have, you can't be anti-Arab and, and, and love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's first and foremost. That, you know, so if you hate Arab, you hate the Prophet Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that can't go together in a single heart. You know, hate and love. You can't hate and love the Prophet Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the same time. He wasn't Arab at the end of the day. But we just understand that Arabness uh, was was not as much about biology as people generally think. Right? Um, and do we do know that some people have some bad experience with that? Now, now they, sometimes I think that we are hypersensitive to certain experiences we have. I'll give you an example. I think I've told this story before. And this is not even with regard to Arabs, this is regarding Pakistan. When I was younger, 15, 16, I started going to the masjid, and I remember um, praying beside a Pakistani man. And when I sit in line, while we were praying, I touched his foot with my foot. And when, when I touched his foot, he moved his foot over. Right? Then I moved my foot closer. He moved his foot over some more. Right? And every, every time I moved my foot and touched his foot, he moved his foot over. Now, I, I included from that reaction, oh, he, he's racist. Now, at the time, I didn't know anything about methods or whatever, you see. But I don't know, maybe the person was racist. Maybe he didn't want to touch a black, black person's foot, you know. But I would think that if the person hated black people that much, he wouldn't come to a black masjid. Because this was a black masjid. <laughs> so I'm just like, well, why would, if he hates black people that much and doesn't want to touch them, why would he come to a black masjid? Now, of course, this is years later, I'm thinking about it. You know? But at that moment, I thought, like, oh, he must be racist. Now, I learned, you know, in the slot, you know, then I need to touch the feet. The feet are supposed to be a certain number of inches apart. And so I think sometimes, we have experiences and we interpret them incorrectly. We interpret the reactions or the way that people speak to us, react to us incorrectly. We, uh, we, we all jump, we have some sense that we jump racism. Now again, I'll give you, again, I'll give you, here's another, here's a heart. Because you know, this is not even about Arabs, you know, but I do think it's an important thing to say. We all are aware that, you know, there have been multiple shootings, white cops, black people. Now, the first explanation that we generally give to that is what? It had to be because of racism. The white person, the white cop, hated black people, so this is why he shot the black person. Now, I remember when I was younger, like right up the street here, like it was like one of like a hot spot, like a couple blocks up here, and it was that street where you turn right. Like with the projects going to what well, it used to be old projects, you know. You know, that was the spot people when you go there, man, you know, the rough stuff happening over there, right? Huh? The bottom. The bottom, right. Right. So the bottom is like, is like, whoa, what I mean, you know, black people, as a black person, it's like, man, I'm scared to walk down there. And there's certain places in West Philly, man, I'm scared to walk down there. Now, that's us reacting to who? Us, our own. So if, as a black person, I can be afraid of another black person, is it not possible for a white person to be afraid of a black person? Right? Is it? No. And so again, the point is not to say that this is exactly why it happened. But the point I'm making is that we have to consider the possibility that these are situations where Police officers are afraid, 
for their lives and they just don't know how to properly react because of it. And of course, we can say they're probably fairly trained, whatever it may be. What we don't, what we, we can do for them. Yeah. But again, the basic point I'm making is that that some of uh, of what these issues is anti-Arabism or anti a bunch of other things, you know, they may not be properly founded. And so, if we embrace Islam, and Islam is about justice for everybody. Islam is about not prejudging anybody. Islam is about due process, right? These are all Islamic principles. That no, no, no bear a burden shall bear the burden of another, right? right? These are Islamic principles, and we apply those to everyone, right? Then, if we believe in Islam, we want Islam in our lives, and we want a, a law's judgment in, a, in our affairs. Then it's easy for us to overcome anti-Arabism, anti-whiteism, anti-police, you know, ism, whatever it may be. That it's easy for us to overcome that because we're living according to the principles that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala calls us to live by. Yes, sir. Um, my good brother, the scholar, Abu Sagina. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that that uh, the, the, you know, plenty of cognitive studies show that that. Uh, our, our racialism and, and our uh, colorism mm -hmm. is, is, is wide spectrum and, and, yes. and, it's, and touches all of us, right? right? And so the cognitive studies that show that we show less empathy, you know, towards blacks, you know, do, blacks do not mm -hmm. escape that. But but that doesn't mean that uh, that, that race is not is not a central factor, as you said before. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the images that we've been shown now, yes. a few hundred years of images, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you know have, have gotten into all of you know. I think uh, not too long ago, I was speaking to another uh, Hispanic sister. And I was asking her about how does it feel like to live amongst, you know, everyone is white here, there's no Hispanics. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, it's, it's wonderful, but there's some that are moving in. I'm afraid. And, and to me, I look, you know, the first yeah. thing that I think is like, really? You know? <laughs> you know, so the fact that it's touched us, you know, yeah, doesn't right, mean right. that, you know. Nonetheless, your yeah. point stands. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I got a statement I want to share with everybody. And then I got a question. Mm -hmm. The statement is, you know, a lot of people may not believe in a, the authenticity of uh, or the trust in this stuff, but the DNA. Mm -hmm. But I had my DNA done through African Ancestry 2011. And I did. Uh, I remember you said it to me. Uh, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I did it to my, I was going to do it to my father, and they said, well, tell you, this is African Ancestry, mm -hmm. ancestry.com. I was going to do it to my father first and say, for 35% of the Afro Americans that we test or do the DNA that swap with you, come up European. So, you know, I grew up with Jim Crow segregation now, so I want to be more African. So, I said, go to your mother first, because I almost always go back. Mm -hmm. So, I did with my mother, mm -hmm. but uh, through them, it came up Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother's name was Lula, mm -hmm. and I found a dress in Arabic where, mm -hmm. not a country where it means beautiful pearls. Mm -hmm. Like it was Lula. Mm -hmm. Then I did my father, and I went back to the Han people of China. Mm -hmm. You know, made a percent African, 17 percent European, 3 percent Asian. But, but because of the phenotype, look, yeah. the black dominated or whatever. Right, right, yeah. Now the other one is about uh, Imam Malik. Mm -hmm. They describe him as being, the way they describe the thing is a Caucasian. Mm -hmm. right. But uh, uh, Sheikh Umar Suleiman heard him say he was Albano. You know, you know that's what, you know, I don't know. He might have read Real. I don't know. I'm not sure. I know well, I've well, seen descriptions of him being white, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, mean, he was no, I, don't, I don't know if he meant he was an albino or not. Yeah, it's not something I not I haven't really deep, I deeper into that. In person, yeah. but I don't know. And I don't know if he, I don't know if he, he read the Arabic and concluded that, but he was say albino. No, but he says albino. Then you have to. If it, I've never seen the word abras, for instance, to describe him You know, I'm not saying it's not there. You know, abras is it's vitiligo, but that's more like albino as well. Mm -hmm. you know, so the same word for like, but vitiligo is usually. Translated as like albino mm -hmm. color as well, mm -hmm. you know. But I haven't seen that personally, or at least I don't recall seeing it for my But I do remember seeing um, descriptions of him as being you know, Abiyal or Ahmad, things like that. You know, so it's mm -hmm. fairly, you know, fairly, you know, fairly you know, like what it's basically. I mean, it's, it's not. It's not. It really doesn't matter. Like if if we find, you know, let's say, if the prophet actually was like white, right, you know, at a certain point, it really doesn't matter. No, I did that. You know, you know, but but you know, but listen, we don't. I, I don't believe that we should call the prophet white or call him black. He wasn't African, he wasn't European. You know, there's so much baggage in those words. Don't translate his description as white. <laughs> right? Don't translate it. And he and he wasn't black because black, you know, for us means African. He wasn't African. I, mm -hmm. He was an Arab. Right? So, 
Uh, and um, so it's, uh, it's, it's important that we do our best to not distort um, um, the legacy. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, because like if it's, if it's so disparaging to refer to him as black, because there's some scholars who are you Kaffir if you say he was a black, right? And then, but, but you also have to say the same thing about calling him white, because if the Arabs considered white to be a negative trait, and they avoided calling people white and called them red instead of, of white because, because of that trait, then it also, we should also avoid referring to him as white, right? in my opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? In terms of um, contemporary identities, two questions I have. I have some people I discuss things with, mm -hmm. and um, they were moving towards the uh, political identity of a conservative, mm -hmm. even to the point of being Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. So what do we say about African-American Muslims who have conservative values to the point where they are Trump supporters? What do you mean by conservative values? Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you mean? I mean what, what, was that, what does that mean? The American Conservative Party, you know, all Islam is conservative. Yeah, yeah, Islam's conservative, conservative there, but it all depends uh, again on uh, you know what's meant by conservative values. If you mean by conservative values, the political conservative values like okay, small government, um, you know, um, I mean, things like that, in particular, like small government, you know, less power for the government, and, you know, less regulation. Among them. That's one thing. Um, which, even that is not a problem. You know, every Muslim, every person has the right to have whatever, you know, opinion that he or she inclines for. I mean, everyone has the right to be. If they're convinced by that, they're persuaded by that, then that's, then that's, their, that's their right. Um, uh, but if we just talking about, of course, conservative moral values, um, why would that be a problem? I mean, because, okay, we don't want people to have sex before marriage, we don't want people to commit adultery, we don't want people to do practice on their homosexual behavior, um, transgenderism, among other things, that, uh, because that's become popular, especially in the Democratic Party, you know, that there should be no reason why Muslims should be in support of any of those sort of uh, anti-conservative uh, um, teachings in terms of morality. Um, and even a person supporting Trump, and said, again, people have the right to support whoever they want. I mean, this is not, this is not a hukum shakti. It's not like a, you know, uh, um, a, 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 a fifth ruling, you know, that all Muslims are expected to abide by, that, you know, that it's, 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 it's haram to vote for Trump, or it's compulsory to vote for the Democrat, to wherever that person turns out to be. No, it's not. It's not a religious rule. I mean, we can make it into a religious ruling, you know, because it does. It's subject. It's subject to that, but it's always going to remain in the realm of uh, disagreement, a difference of opinion, khilaf. Right. So she had an issue. Right. So people have different reasons for supporting different candidates, uh, and um, if the person feels that the individual um, um, supports your values more than another, then why not give them the opportunity to do that? Especially knowing <laughs> there's a freedom, freedom of, 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 of speech, freedom of, 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 you know, of conscience, among other things. You know? So um, those are the things that, that can be supported. So uh, hopefully that answers your, your concern. Yes, yeah. the the follow up? Yeah, it's a different subject, mm -hmm. but in terms of uh, Identifying ourselves, we have um, different people who are trying to attach different values, or not values, but uh, identities to us. So we have some that say we're the tribe of Shabazz, others that try to link the um, uh, Moorish identity to us. And uh, I'm sorry, brother, could you be a little more invisible? You know, just, you know, I'm trying to speak to the Sheikh and. Oh, I'm I sorry. This side, I go on this side, and all I'm getting is you. <laughs> oh, I, 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 all you getting is me? Okay, I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been running back and forth. <laughs> uh, so I'm sorry. So, what was it? so some people identify as the tribe of Shabazz, and yeah. others uh, more secret, more more and, uh, um, Some people, you know, identify in terms of uh, method and things of that mm -hmm. nature. And some people say, no, we just Muslims. You know? mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if, if you could speak a little bit about identity and 
in this day and time, what's the benefit? Well, I mean, the social cultural uh, sort of ident identification like Moors, like Moors or or um, <clears throat> members of the tribe of Shabazz and things like that. I mean, I really don't know what that means today. I would say you're, you're from the tribe of Shabazz. Uh, um, I know it definitely had meaning for people who were in the first resurrection and really was a source of, of mobilization and unity for people to think of themselves as being distinct from the oppressor class you know, um, during that time. Um, but um, members of the more Science Central uh, Temple, of course, we know there's many things that are very problematic about that theologically. You know that Muslims, you know, they're not Moors in that same way that you know, of course the calls of you know Dr. Ali, and of course any individual supposedly wrote his own Quran because it seems to be clear uh, But um, we do understand, try to understand them in their historical context. You know what they, you know. Building off of very limited amount of knowledge about religion, about Islam, you know, to continue that into to today, I think is it's not really a tenable. It's not a tenable um, uh, um, um, argument that, that one one can make in support in support of, of that. But but the issue of methods is different because we're just simply talking about different interpretations of the Quran and Sunnah. Um, and um, to say it wasn't Hanafi, it just means that we got all the Quran and Sunnah according to the interpretation of Hanifa, or Amadi, or Shafi, or Muhammad, and because the Quran is, is subject to, or the Sunnah, or subject to multiple interpretations in, in area of law on a number of issues. You know? So there's nothing problematic about that that people identify with those schools. Um, we're just always told that you should never blindly follow any man. All right, other than the prophet, I mm -hmm. no. Is there anything else? I want to read more one last. Uh, yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just no, go ahead. No. What I was going to say is I'm looking forward to reading. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this is in the uh, the concluding section of perceiving black through Arab eyes. <clears throat> Uh, page 72, and the, the conclusion said, Not, notwithstanding the flaws in pan Africanist theorizing, there is one valid area of critique which can be underscored. Because prior to this, I talked about the, the pan Africanist critique of, of Arabs and Islam. Um, that is a matter of black African enfranchisement in Arab and, Ar Ar and Muslim societies. The very fact that three scholars, Jacques and Nojozi and Sfilti, three centuries apart from one another, the 9th, 12th, 15th century respectively, in their three societies ruled by people who presumably of non-black skin, um, felt it necessary to write treatises in defense of black, speaks of the perennial problem of black antipathy. Uh, so, 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 point being that this has been a problem in our tradition. And if it wasn't a problem, then scholars wouldn't have written books about it, you know, with the, you know, elevating the status of blacks, uh, removing or uh, granting Tenuido um, Kabash, right? And so the uh, books about the Fakhr Sudan al Iran, the boasts of blacks over the whites. You know? So it's been a particular problem. The Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, clearly tried his best to give Africans a prominent role in his community by giving Bilal the important function of, ma of making the call to prayer. There even exists a report that states, governing belongs to the Quraysh, judgment belongs to the Ansar, the summons belongs to the Abyssinians, and the treasury belongs to us, the people of Yemen. Whatever the actual authenticity of this report, there is little doubt that inclusion was an aim of the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The 9th century was also important in that it saw the 14-year-long Negro Zanj uh, rebellion in, in Iraq. It was immediately before, I mean, the 9th century, I think it was the 19th, the 9th, the 9th century was also important in that it saw the 14-year-long 14, 14 Negro or Zanj rebellion in, in Iraq. It was immediately before this time that Jahiz, black himself, wrote his pioneering work, Fakhr Sudan al Bilan, a boast of the blacks over the whites. It seemed that black pride was a growing sentiment uh, of the time in light of an overall sense of unfair treatment. 
Mention of that, however, is meant not to overshadow the growing white or pro-Persian sentiment pervading during the time as well. If black antipathy was widespread, one could also one could say that white antipathy among Arabs was just as common. This underscores the earlier point that Arabs view themselves as distinct from Africans, Persians, Romans, and Levantines. This would corroborate the assertion that Arabs were not a white race, at least not in their own eyes. And even though Prophet Muhammad apparently included Arabs in the category of blacks, they did not perceive of themselves as being simply of as simply a species of African. If there was any black scholar during the ninth century who could be described as a medieval Pan-Africanist, that scholar would be Jahiz. In his work, Jahiz makes a number of claims, among which are Sub-Saharan Africans have closer blood ties to Qahtani Arabs in Southern Arabia than the Northern Adnanis have the Qahtanis. And that the ten sons of Prophet Muhammad's grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, were dark, black, and bulky. He also declares beauty and desire to be subjective. In this regard, he says, if whites gaze upon blacks without lust, then the same applies to the blacks gaze upon whites. This is in light of the fact that lusts are dispositions, the most of which results from the manic limitation. Consequently, the most desirable women in the, the most desirable women to the men of Basra are Indian women and the girls of the Jordan Valley. The most attractive women to those of Yemen are Abyssinian women and girls, while the most desirable women to those of the Levant are Greek women and girls. Men's lusts are merely directed towards those they acquire through trade and capture, except for abnormal men. But an analogy is not constructed upon the anomaly. This shows the mutual disdain which existed against pre-modern peoples, so that attraction and repulsion oftentimes result from the frequency and infrequency of interaction between people. In other words, while the place of the sub-Saharan on the humanity scale in the eyes of many historically is at the bottom, this was not due to the single factor of blackness. It had much to do with notions, notions of inferior civilization or former slave status. So this, this is so much more that goes here, but uh, I think an important point is that, um, that while we've been focused on how Arabs view blacks, there was also uh, a mutual disdain from blacks towards Arabs. Now, when we even think about the disdain that Arabs had for the Africans, we can say, okay, it was because they were black. We say, well, that can't hold up because if the Arabs themselves were melanated people, then it's like, well, why would it be because they're black? You can't possibly do that alone. Uh, so when we look at the fact that the history, we actually see that there was a time when the Abyssinians actually invaded Arabia. Remember that? They ruled parts of Arabia. They invaded Arabia. They remember they were coming to destroy the capital. Right? So there was there was reason for there to be some ant ant antagonism between the two peoples beyond simply the the, the consideration of color, whether it's about the black and so on. The Arabs are just all white. So again, keep coming back to the question of, of like the anti-Arabness that we find among uh, many of our brothers and sisters is that a lot of it is rooted in the misconception that Arabs are a white race. Right? So they're just white, just like Europeans, and just like the Europeans, they enslaved the black people. Uh, or as Chancellor Williams said, the re same reason that blacks are in Arabia, the same reason that blacks are in America, through um, invasion and abduction and capture. Right? And they said, well, it's not as easy, it's not as simple as that. Right? So, I mean, the Abyssinians invaded the Arabians as well. Right? And so sometimes they lost. And so you lose war, you can become captive. captive right? There are Arabs who were slaves. Zayr ibn Haditha was a slave, slave. He was kidnapped, he was young. So Hayyab al was kidnapped, he was young. And Abbas and Abdul Muttalib, the prophet's uh, uncle, was kidnapped when he was a, he was a boy, a little boy. And his mother prayed, and then Allah brought him back. Right? But, but this was the norm. People, Arabs were, were slaves. I mean, um, what, actually, one of the reasons that the, the marriage between Zayn and Haditha and uh, Zayn and Bin Jats didn't work out, in my, in my view, was because of classism. 
right? That she herself, she was from a high upper class and he was a former slave, right? So it was just like it was difficult for her to deal with that, being married to an individual who was a former slave. It wasn't, it wasn't about color at all, right? On the other hand, you find someone like Thabit um, ibn Qais ibn Shalmaz, who was married to the sister of Abdullah ibn Ubay, who was a chief hypocrite, his wife Abiba, that she decided that she wanted a divorce from from Thabit because, and he's an Arab, he's an authentic Arab, he says, she said, I saw him, uh, I saw him approaching in a group of men, and he was, uh, he was the blackest among them, uh, he was the shortest among them, <laughs> and the one with the ugliest face. <laughs> this is the narrative that say the blackest, the shortest, and the ugliest of all of them, you know, and she decided, you know what, I can't deal with this. You see, now, so but it wasn't. Notice she didn't only say because he's black, right? She is, but she mentioned two other characteristics as well. You know? But again, he's a black Arab. He's a black Arab. Um, Abu Dhar al Rivari. <coughs> people often mention the story of Abu Dhar al Rivari and his um, his uh, disputes, uh, apparent dispute with Bilal al Rabak, which actually, um, I mean, I think there's enough evidence to say that it did, it did occur, but the question of him calling Bilal Ibn Saudad, the mother of the black woman, that, that in itself is actually a very weak narration, with that, that phrase, that wording. And, and, some, and it also doesn't really make a lot of sense because um, if he's going to berate Bilal for his mother, he's also berating Amr al and all these other Arabs who had black mothers. Right? So at any rate, uh, Abu Dhar al Bifari, when you look at his description, Abu Dhar was, he was brown. So it's like, well, he's berating Bilal, and he himself, he's brown as well, right? So, um, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really, uh, it's, it, it's, there's a mutual disdain, right? So Arabs didn't like Africans, and Africans didn't like the Arabs either, right? Yeah. And, uh, if they were xenophobic towards the African, African also xenophobic towards them, as the Persian was xenophobic towards those who were in Persian. That was just the, the nature of the world at the time, see? You know, and just that the time we lived in, lead us to focus only on blackness and that this idea that going way back into the past that the blacks are just always in the position that we that the black American has been in the Americas, right? You know, that we always been powerless and never had you know, a country, never you know, invaded people, never colonized people. And of course not to the extent that other people, yes, we haven't colonized people to the extent that, and a lot of other people, but that uh, uh, we, it just, this is about trying to um, keep in mind that uh, our, our perceptions are being projected back to a, a previous time where people didn't share the same perceptions or the same presumptions. So we just have to be very careful about that. And I'm hoping that reading uh, this book and hopefully other things that I'll write in the future will help us to heal. Right? Because once we realize, okay, we've been constructed. We've been constructed. And I'm not in favor of us saying, you know, let's just stop calling ourselves black people anymore. No, I'm not saying that at all. So yeah, I'm a black person, I'm a black American. Right? I'm not even calling myself African. Again, I didn't, I'm not from Africa. I mean, I didn't grow up in Africa. I didn't, I'm not culturally Af African. I don't know much about African history or any culture in Africa. I didn't really know. I didn't, you know I'm a black American, you see. Um, so, 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 because if we do, if we say, okay, well, stop, then just stop saying white people, black people, Latino, whatever, right? Then we're fundamentally, we're erasing people's experience, people's history in the process, right? And, and when we do that, we just say, we're just all human beings. Then there's going to be some discrimination happening, which is that we can no longer acknowledge it. Because no, we're, all, we're all the same people. We're all just Americans. That's all we are. We're just Americans. No. <laughs> No, we're not. And if that was the case, then we all be being treated equally. But we're not being treated equally. And that's why, you know, this, this problem exists. But I do think that the more we understand what aspects of our identities um, have been constructed and how they're being politicized, right, for some people's benefit, not to our own benefit, but other people's benefit, then it will be easier for us to resist and to also respond to all of the manipulation in a way that will be healthy and enriching and, and, and actually will contribute to less polarization than to more.
right. as it is, it's, it's been being done right now uh, in our country, and perhaps we see say even in our world. So, okay, good enough. Yes, no more questions. How many of the